Here I am, an ocean scientist for three and a half decades, and I sit in a lot of meetings with leading ocean scientists still today, but it just it kind of mystifies me that more people aren't intellectually curious about what the story of the century is, and that's these, these that are occurring in the water. So if anything, I'd like to get our, our ocean science community and science community in general just more involved with, with the study of these phenomena so we can better understand them and, and know really how, how to interact with them and how to move forward. Chris Lado, welcome to Lado Files. Hello, welcome. I'm here with uh, retired Admiral Tim Gallaudet. Thank you so much for being here, sir. How are you doing? I'm doing great, Chris. It's really an honor for me to be with you. Okay, per yeah. Thank you so much for your time and really for speaking out on on the UAP topic. I, I, I recently watched your interview uh, with Ryan Graves on the Merge podcast. And I'm really impressed with your support um, for Ryan Graves. And, and really, it sounded like you're the only admiral. Does he have any other support, you know, from other flag officers or other generals or admirals that you know? Of? Yeah, that I know of, no. And in fact, I haven't seen any of my former fellow flag officers speak up on this. And I'm, I'm, I'm mystified, to be honest with you, because of, you know, the relative importance of this issue in so many areas for Ryan's safety of flight. For Avi Lowe, who I work with, just scientific understanding of our place in the universe. There's just so many things that make this issue so compelling. And I just don't understand why people with my ba background, similar background, aren't more engaged. You mentioned one four star, you know, that, that said he, he is interested. It, it sounds like there is maybe behind the scenes, there's some sort of activity going on. Maybe they're just scared to publicly announce any support. Well, I... I I think a lot of them still are bound by certain NDAs and they had intelligence backgrounds. And I think that's probably the source of the greatest hesitancy. So it's NDAs related to security classification? I would bet. Yeah, I would bet that. But then, yes, ultimately, when I when I speak out about my knowledge, having seen the GoFast video on the Navy secret internet, those that video was released. So I'm not really bound by any uh, NDA on that particular video, which I've seen. Yeah, I remember you mentioned that that the 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 Sipper video went out, or it was an email that went out by video on the on the secret network, and then it was the next day, I guess, or shortly after, was deleted. Did you ever talk to any of the other people that maybe have been in that chain and then email chain? I did not. I, I, I wanted to, and I did talk to my deputy, who was a, a senior executive and civilian in the in the Navy, and you know we of course had a discussion about extraterrestrial intelligence and technology and pretty much concluded that had to be it, but we didn't follow up further. And I did not in the chain of command just because it was never discussed again. And again, the email was taken from my computer. It was wiped from mine and everybody who received it. So I, I, per, I concluded that it must've been, and we know now part of a special access program and the, the two star who sent that email to everybody, all the subordinate commanders under us lead forces, he obviously was taken out. It was it was removed, and I I wouldn't didn't want really want to get him into any security trouble by highlighting the fact of what happened. That was the reason why I never pursued it further while in uniform. Yeah, I don't blame you. I can't. I don't know what what you could have done in that situation. Yeah, exactly. Um, but you're as a so you were really in charge of support personnel in which division of the Navy was it scientific or what was your actual day to day job? My my day to day job was operational. I was in charge of all the meteorologists in the Navy and, and oceanographers and hydrographers. So those are the folks like you have them in the Air Force. You have Air Force weather meteorologists who give you or try to give you good weather forecasts before you fly. Or you, that's what you experience. We have the same folks in the Navy. They do a lot more though. They do a lot of oceanography analysis to support anti submarine warfare. And we made charts of the seafloor using hydrographic ships. And, and those are all the folks that I was I, I oversaw. They were on every aircraft carrier in the Navy, supporting air operations, both in the training ranges and deployed overseas. And then these folks were on six of our oceanographic ships, now seven, that are all around the world doing various mapping and oceanographic collection. And, and then a number of civilians at centers in the U.S. doing weather modeling, ocean modeling, and 
working with a lot of data and databases and, and supporting the Navy through that information. I see. And you've also done an, an amazing amount of undersea, it sounds like, exploration. You have a, a photo in the back there of you diving. Where <laughs> is right. that photo? Yeah. This is so when I was leading the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, NOAA, that's the Navy's top ocean, weather, climate, and environmental agency. And that picture is from Lake Huron, and it's in a place called the Thunder Bay National Marine Sanctuary. These are these are like the National Marine Sanctuaries are the nation's national underwater parks. And so in Thunder Bay, for example, they the park preserves a number of old shipwrecks. And I'm, I'm diving there on one of the shipwrecks. And then there's other national marine sanctuaries like that in Florida Keys, which which his goal is to preserve and conserve coral reefs down there. We have several out California that are designed to protect the ecosystems out there, like kelp forests, et cetera. There's, there's, there's 15 total. Excellent. And you also mentioned Avi Loeb. Actually, most of my audience should know Avi Loeb has recently found the, the spherules out at the ocean floor. And you have a friend you mentioned as well in the Merge podcast that actually checked out some coordinates out under the Catalina or nearby the Catalina islands. Amazing effort there. Can you explain what he found and what your thoughts are on that area? Right, right. That was interesting. There is a geologic feature that I described on Ryan's show that right now I've not been able to find a, a natural explanation for. It looks like a wedge taken off a, a thing called a knoll. It looks like an underwater ridge, basically. And, and, a, and a wedge from it was totally carved out and horizontally displaced two kilometers it's on the seafloor. It's at a depth of about 700 meters. And it, I, of course, I, I just want to find an explanation for it, but it, it does cause one to speculate. It, is that evidence of undersea UAP interaction with the seafloor or even or a location for undersea infrastructure where these things go? And so that's what my friend, Victor Vescovo is his name. He's a world famous undersea explorer. He's been diving in all the deepest trenches of the world and is a human occupied submersible that he built and uh, he also acquired the ship to do it. And he spent $50 million of his own money to go mapping and exploring all around the, the world's oceans. And at, so at the time I knew him, I had an agreement signed with him when I was at NOAA for him to map and explore the oceans and share his data with us. And Victor, as we stayed in touch, told me he was gonna do some checkout data collection of a new sonar system he put on a ship. And I, when I heard about it, it was off SoCal, and we were hearing all this news about SoCal UAP. I said, hey, if you really want to uh, do an underwater expedition, expedition like none other, I got some coordinates for you. And I explained to him why. And he, he didn't laugh or, or not answer me. He said, send me the coordinates. And he did. And he went and mapped that to a higher resolution than we have before. But he wasn't able to get video on it. And that's what we really wanted. And so now that's the next step is getting a remotely operated vehicle from a ship, tethered to a ship. And really getting some video on the feature and where it was taken from and we'll see what we find uh okay can you tell us where it is <laughs> no, no, I'm not, I'm that's the is it secret no. are you keeping this secret information i assumed I mean, it would be secret i'm keeping the coordinates close because i've been approached by a producer from netflix and he he may be funding an expedition to go dive on it and i, I basically don't want anybody to beat me out on it but i can tell you it's 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 a it's in the Southern California Bight, in between Catalina Catalina Island and uh, Long Beach. Oh, okay. So down in this area. Yeah, in between. Yeah, go if you where's Catalina? Right. Yeah, it's in yeah. that region. Oh, cool. Okay, excellent. Yeah, and I had mapped. You know, the Tic Tac basically went down somewhere in this area, I believe. Yeah, that's correct. And Chris, it's important. Here's something important for people. I've mm. seen a couple shows on TV speculating on undersea UAP bases in this region, and they picked out a feature in the region I, I mentioned. There's a lot of the speculation. I've, the, the reason features will look like they do on this map is it's an amalgamation of a number of different data sources, some with very high resolution, so you see fine granularity in some of the features, and then some with very coarse resolution, and that's where you see some of the smearing. So a lot of the speculation is based off, it's incorrect, and it's based off artifacts in the data. And so there, that's, yeah. I have a problem when people go and run off on, on these, these different issues when they haven't, don't really understand the sources of the data. 
Yeah, exactly. Because I, you know, I've I've messed around on here, and you see crazy, crazy shapes. You know, with a with a tic tac, or was was under the water, or there's some object under the water. But how can you tell? You know, because if you zoom in, uh, as you know, I learned dealing with satellite imagery with you know targeting is you have to know your source, right? You have to know how good your data is. And then here it's it's blurry, you know? Right. Interesting. And and I know some people have come to me and they're, if you look at this, this database here, there are certain features down near Antarctica that are all linear. And people have said, oh my gosh, this is evidence of some, some you know, uh, non-natural feature. Is it is it UAP, you know, generate or, or hiding infrastructure or whatever and it's it's on the in the ocean side of this chris i forgot where exactly but yeah. all that means is that that is a very data sparse region and an oceanographic ship happened to make a transit with a very high resolution sonar to get some really nice pristine data that is unlike the rest of the interpolated data around it so when you see linear linear features like that it, it, you have to really understand where like where, where the source of the data is to to be able to conclude what they are. Hmm. You mentioned on, on Ryan's show as well that one reason you, you decided to speak out, and again, I, I said it before, but thank you so much for speaking out as a retired officer. You know, you're one of the few, and like you mentioned, it, it doesn't sound like anyone else is really supporting Ryan, but you said you spoke out because you want to correct some misconceptions that you saw out there. What are, what are some other misconceptions about maybe how people understand the government should work, but it's not correct? Yeah, that's a good question, Chris. Thank you. And I appreciate your kind words. Uh, a lot of people will, and this, I did talk about this with Ryan, they, they, they sort of surmise the government is intentionally obfuscating and hiding. And there are certain points where they do because, for example, Title 50 of the U.S. Code directs certain activities that we don't acknowledge, uh, unacknowledged activities. So we're never going to acknowledge that we're, for example, collecting information in our adversaries' backyards with satellites or whatever else we do. But at the same time, a lot of things that you'll see in the UAP world, especially UFO Twitter, arise from just not understanding how the government works. And, and I don't think everything is intentionally withheld. It might just be because certain people aren't read in or cleared for that, that information. And that, that, that is what I believe is probably one of the top sources of non-disclosure is that really strict classification guidance that people are bound by. And so we may, we may be hearing people talking about the president or the national security advisor or the secretary of defense, all having some kind of, you know, conspiracy agenda to withhold information. And they might not even be read in to those programs, which is, it's highly likely that they're not because you, they're, they're so tightly controlled and the access lists are so limited. And at the same time, as I talked about too, there's almost this culture within the career bureaucrats who run these special access programs to keep them away or shield them from the types of people like me who rotate in and out of leadership jobs every so every few years. And I experienced that culture mm. firsthand. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I understand that better now because you mentioned in the, in the interview with Ryan that there was kind of a, an issue where you mentioned you had a why you were in charge of people like a dispersed commander, if you will. You're in charge of people that were dispersed in many different ships or units across the world. Is that correct? That, at my at my top job, yes. When I was the commander of all the Navy meteorology and oceanography forces, that was that was how it was. I had a I was I was shore based personally, but uh, all, a lot of my sailors were either at shore centers providing information like weather to ships at sea, or they were actually at sea. And, but, but by the way, mind you, I worked my way up. So I've been to sea. I, I've been on aircraft carriers. I've been on amphibious assault ships, hydrographic survey ships, destroyers, you name it. And so I, I was at a point, you know, at the, at the tip of the sphere, if you will, in the Arabian Gulf, in the Arabian Sea, and during the, both the uh, Iraqi freedom and enduring freedom. And even before that, just after the first Gulf War. So that I've seen both. And that, that, yeah. that was, that was my issue that I spoke to with Ryan, that, that I, I would, want to know certain collection programs that my sailors were using the data from right. and I'm overseeing how they operate and I'm right I'm in charge of all their processes and protocols and how they do weather and provide weather support to the Navy 
And then, and I had, I had individuals wanting me to sh- keep me from being read into certain collection programs yes. because I didn't have a need to know. I wasn't at the pointy end of the sphere. However, I was directing uh, all the activities and the support infrastructure framework for these sailors. And it, that, it, that wasn't a huge issue for me, but, but it, it was an example of how that occurs. I guess what I wanted to sort of use that to illustrate is the, the validity of this Wilson memo that I'm, you probably have covered in previous shows. Have you? Yes. I also know some of the people involved. So I'll just say that, that I, I was certain that was very, that was valid and authentic because I felt, I felt just like Admiral Wilson in certain occasions during my career where I wanted to get more information and, Oh no, sir, you can't know that. Not, and I think that's ridiculous to do that, to withhold information from key leaders as well as mm. the Congress. You were a uh, senior leader in charge of all these hundreds and thousands of people. Um, but because you're you're not there, you know, on the ship in person, um, they're not going to give you a need to know. So since you're you're separated, I guess, uh, like administratively, they can ju- it's it's a barrier essentially. These civilian people maybe that have been in the government for a long time are able to keep the information away from, like you mentioned, people that they don't believe have a full skin in the game or they can't make them sign an NDA, for instance. Well, I, I can tell you this, Chris, that it, it's not uniform, okay? There are times where I think it was appropriate for me not to have been read into certain programs. So I wouldn't blanket that at all. There, there's there's good reason in a lot of cases to keep these access lists very limited. But yes. but again, I, I say there should be exceptions. And ultimately, that that whole culture and that, that process has resulted in where we are now, a lot of information being withheld from people who should know it. And you mentioned there, can we get any more information on the Eric Davis Wilson case? Because from what I understand is Admiral Wilson said that, you know, he denied it, that it, that it never happened and the, and the meeting didn't happen. What is your take on that? Yeah, that's what I find interesting. So, but I I can't really say much because I've never spoken to Admiral Wilson. And so I, I'll just say that's, that's a conflict. And I, uh, I will lean on the side of Eric Davis, to be honest with you. Wow. Excellent. So you were in, in charge of NOAA. That's that's interesting. Have you seen, and I only mentioned this because I was just interviewing this guy, Ashton Forbes. I don't know if you've seen it on X, but we basically had these two videos here and I originally thought they were totally debunked. And I'm just going to, and, and again, only show because he argues this is a actual national oceanographic satellite, NROL-22. Yeah. That actually is not a NOAA satellite, Chris. It's it, yeah, it's, it's the title of the satellite is something like National Ocean Surveillance something. I don't remember it exactly, but this is an intelligence satellite. It is not a NOAA environmental satellite, so I really can't say anything about it. I, I don't even okay. know. I, I'd never seen a satellite video. Obviously, they're hard to find online. I, I was never read into any satellite stuff, so but yeah, I just only because he yeah he argued it was a national asset, but it seems like a targeting asset to me. What What is yes. your just take on this video while we have it up, while I'm showing it? What is your thoughts? Well, it's pretty extraordinary, right? I've seen this. I, I've not seen in data like this myself. I've not seen national assets and, and this Reaper data. I've never seen that. So I have no knowledge of how that really looks. And I just can't comment. It's extraordinary for sure yeah. what you're watching, but I really don't know of its validity. I, I actually did read recently... Yeah. An analysis in Newsweek that debunked this, saying the the information that they, the satellites they cited were built after this airliner disappeared. I, I don't know. I really don't know, yeah. Chris. But it's very interesting. Yeah, it's yeah, extremely interesting. You know, it's just an interesting, interesting field we find ourselves in investigating these. Can you can you talk about what you're what you're working on now? What is your what is your I guess near term goal for the UAP efforts? What's your goals? Yeah, thank you. Well, for certainly overall, more disclosure of information to the public. So I have three lines of effort, maybe more. I'm working with Avi Loeb on the Galileo project, just contributing where I can. He had that Pacific Ocean expedition to find the remnants of that interstellar meteor, and he did find them. And I, I provided a, a good amount of NOAA data. I connected him with some NOAA offices to help determine the drift of the debris once it hit the atmosphere using atmospheric winds during the day uh, when it impacted the earth, as well as oceanic current profiles. 
Uh, I didn't get to go on that expedition, but I'm going to hopefully get on the next one where he's going to search for bigger stuff using high frequency sonar, which I know a little bit about because my PhD is in underwater acoustics. And then in general, though, with his work to scientifically explore UAP, he doesn't have a budget and the expertise to look at the undersea side of it. So that's what I talked to Ryan about is I do want to do more. And a couple of members of his Galileo project are working with me to see what we can do to build a similar undersea observatory like he's doing in different places. And, uh, and of course, I would do that in concert with the different assets that are already in place, like those of the Naval Oceanographic Office, my old agency, NOAA, and the Office of Naval Intelligence. So that's one area, scientific research. There's another area I'm very interested in, that's, that's Ryan's uh, work to get more reporting, certainly from civil air, for the safety of flight concerns that UAP present. As, as I explained on Ryan's podcast, I was the chief meteorologist of the Navy. And so my job, one of my main jobs was safety of flight. And to have the Navy have said nothing about that issue with respect to UAP really bothers me. Now, I understand why classification issues. That's the again, my, the two star admiral who sent that information out and then had the, 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 the video swipe from our computers. I understand that. And he didn't want to get in trouble. But someone needs to look at this rationally and say, hey, wait a minute. If our aviators at risk and they're doing the mitigation on scene out there in the training range, that's a problem. People in, were in my shoes, you know, senior leadership, should be putting forth policy to ensure they're protected and safe. So that's one area, safety of flight, supporting Ryan. I'm on his advisory board. And then the third major effort I've started, I've joined the advisory board for Gary Nolan's Soul Foundation. And that's a really new effort. Not much has come out about it. And he's going to have his first inaugural symposium summit in uh, November at Stanford University, which I will be attending and speaking at. And that effort is all about public policy. And this is why I absolutely think we need to have some level of disclosure in that if we are interacting with entities that we don't know where they came from and we don't, don't understand how they came from where they came from and we don't understand why they're doing it, number one, we ought to get together as a society and develop policy on how to interact with these for various purposes, whether to benefit from the technology, to ensure public safety if they're not friendly and or or if they're in some way interfering with any of our the safe conduct of what we do, commerce, trade, et cetera, like with Ryan uh, or and everything else that comes around it. So Gary's great team, Peter Scapefish is his is a partner in this effort. He's working to have conversations to further advance the public policy around UAP. Great, great idea. I mean, think about this. Here's the way they put it. This could be 9-11 on steroids if, if we walk that far further. And Hollywood is treated as such. If you look at movies like War of the Worlds or Arrival or what have you, Close Encounters. So <laughs> the fact that we've even Hollywood is, has dreamed up all these scenarios and we haven't had a mature conversation about the public policy around real UAP, we are way behind the curve there. Hmm. And what is your take on you know, David Grush, his argument that it, it's a crash retrieval program that our that our government has, you know, our elements of the government have been keeping this secret for so long. You know, what is do you do you believe, you know, do you buy into that kind of a narrative or what's your take on David Grush and his, his claims? Yeah, that's great, Chris. Well, first of all, I think he's 100 percent credible. And I think what he testified to is correct, is real. Now, I don't have I wasn't running into the program, so I don't have data, information, knowledge of the materials or the biologics that he mentioned. So I, I'd say my confidence is 99.9% because the 1% only being, I didn't see it myself, but I know how, how the system works. And, you know, he's, he's gone on other shows and uh, productions, if you will, on YouTube, and he's 100% legitimate. Uh, I, I was in, read into programs like his, and I understand how things work. And he, when he testified, I, he was absolutely credible. I, and I mean, the whole thing about him and his PTS, that post-traumatic stress, and, th and them trying to bury him or somehow reduce his credibility or question it because of that, that was so harmful and wrong. I, I've worked with Navy SEALs for one of my times of my career, and they all have come back with PTS. Real, real credible, solid heroes like him in Afghanistan. So no, in no way should we ever think that will degrade or undermine his story. I think he's 100% credible and I've seen the systems that he's worked in and I, I get I get everything about what he testified to. And 
And again, a lot of the public doesn't know that. They've not worked with the DOD. They don't understand classification processes. That guy is 100% the real deal. And I even wrote an article about it after the hearing. Yeah. And he mentioned actually that they used his PTS prior to him going public. It was almost to try and stop him from, from coming out for the reprisals. And it seems like there has been a lot of reprisals or pressure against the whistleblowers. My, I guess my own personal belief is that we have serious issues as a nation dealing with issues such as Edward Snowden and Julia Assange, Julian Assange. You know, I, I know they're very controversial. Not yeah. in my lifetime will I ever endorse either of those two. However, yeah, I, I will speak in favor of Grush and what he's doing. I'm going to talk about undersea UAP because I'm an expert about ocean things. And I'm not going to really go anywhere else. <laughs> so, yeah. and, and this, is, this is one of those issues. Okay, excellent. And so what is your take on the disclosure? Lou Elizondo basically posted a tweet yesterday, and it was a very optimistic tweet. You know, I'll show it here on the screen for us. But basically, he's saying that 2024 will be a, a, a banner year, essentially, for UAP disclosure. David Grush mentioned kind of the same thing in his Yes Theory. He said in, in February, we should expect some sort of event. And then he expects some sort of executive branch you know, statement by the end of the year is his hope. Do you have any more information on that or what's your take on that? Well, I know that it's not uniform in the in the Congress and the executive branch. And, and as evidenced by the the White House, the director of national intelligence, the NSC, no, no one's speaking in favor and, and, and Sean Kirkpatrick in terms of Grush's testimony. So that's that's a problem. It's going to be really hard to get the executive branch to open up. And in fact, it's going to be impossible short of legislation, which I also talked about on Ryan's show. So that's that's it. We really got to get that legislation passed. But I know mm -hmm. there's there's certain members that don't want it passed for various reasons. And that's that's going to be a challenge. But I, I'm like them. I'm optimistic. I think there's a great need for it. And there there are a lot of people behind the scenes talking with staffers like Lou and Chris Mellon that are working that are working to get that done. And, and I am, I'm eager as well. I think it's really long overdue. I too don't want to see some of the technology released only because of the national security implications, but there's just certain aspects about UAP and acknowledgement of them and, and what they are and the nature of them that we really have to get out there in a public forum, again, so we can develop the proper policy, maybe advance important technology needs and, and others. I also think Lou and David they're pretty savvy. This, they're in this issue. They're in the middle of it. So I, 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 I trust their outlook. Okay, excellent. Yeah, I was just speculating that the the NDA twenty twenty four that that you mentioned that amazing act the Dis the UAP Disclosure Act is what they even called it uh, an amazing act in there. Yeah, that was requiring a presidential panel. Is uh, I was interested to see. I think a nine person panel, and so I was wondering if that's the event that we're expecting in February, you know, the formation of this panel. And then that may lead to some sort of a discussion from the president. I don't know. Does that well, that's right. If, yeah, because the law, if that's passed, if that the UAP Disclosure Act is passed in the law, then that just sets forth everything in it and uh, the establishment of the panelists and everything they're going to do. Yeah, that that is what we hope for. I am very excited. I, I've been uh, I, I've been contributing names to different people who are who are involved uh, in behind the scenes, and it'll be very exciting to see who ends up actually making that uh, the composition of that board or that panel. And then there used to be, or there was rumors of a Senate Armed Services hearing. You know, supposed to happen in September, or and then we had the issue with uh, McCarthy, and then the, a lot of political issues. Have you heard anything about any sort of Senate intelligence hearing? No, I'm not. Uh, I'm not mm -hmm. on the Hill as much as others, uh, really rarely. And it's usually working for my working regarding my old organization, NOAA. So I've not followed it. I don't know. But um, yeah, I mean, there, there's that's the way Congress is. So I have worked with Congress and I've testified in front of Congress seven, eight times. And, mm -hmm. you know, every day is you got all the the fires to put out, whether it be, for example, today, Israel and Hamas and Ukraine. And then there's the undercurrent of trying to do long-term policy development. This that's like the UAP Disclosure Act. And you know, any given day, it's it's just 
is anybody's guess what's going to actually rise to the occasion here and actually get done, what hearings actually going to occur. Yeah, it's, it's quite a, for anybody who's worked on the Hill, they know exactly what I'm talking about, but it, it's a, it's a fever pitch and I'm just thankful I'm not working on the Hill right now. And have you ever seen a UAP or? You know, interestingly, no, I've not. And so that's what it, that's what it is. But I saw the video on the Navy secret internet of the go fast before it was released. And that was enough for me as well as just knowledge of people and others who have, I've begun to interview people, uh, uh, especially those who have undersea UAP observations. And I'm receiving some amazing stories of all sorts of types of observations under the uh, water and those that go trans medium. Uh, and, and, uh, and, and it's only convincing me more of the need to do this. I, I, I shared with Ryan, it's, it's amazing where you, where these things come up. I, I don't go out on any, any given day and intend to talk about UAP to anybody I meet on the street, but sometimes it, it, it comes in conversation and that's happened that one day I went fishing down the Florida Keys and my guide is telling me about that saying, Hey, do you know about that hearing? And I said, well, I was in the front row. So with, with you, uh, Chris, and, yeah. and we started talking and I got led me to interview this other guy who has had multiple observations. He's seen air jet F-16s, your old aircraft from a uh, uh, Homestead Air Force Base sortie after them. Quite uh, incredible. And this just these stories come up almost weekly to me for new accounts and instances that people want to come out now that because someone like me, a credible authority uh, is interested in the topic. And I've actually interviewed John Ramirez. I don't know if you saw that that interview. Uh, quite interesting. Um, he's mentioned um, ASW. So I guess tracking things underwater, spe specifically submarines. You mentioned there you did your uh, PhD thesis. How, how does that work? I don't know. Can you just give... I tried to look online. You know, I think a lot of the stuff is obviously highly classified, but what is the basic premise of, of tracking undersea objects and how could we use it for UAP detection? Yeah, there's two ways, Chris. First off, active sonar is taking a transducer, a sonar that can generate a, a pulse of energy in the water and it's in the form of sound and, and a, wave a sound wave will propagate through the water at a certain speed and in, in a certain direction. And uh, the reflection of that sound off a, an object like an uh, adversary submarine then will return to your sonar and you can listen to it. And, and that the, the, the time it takes knowing the speed of sound, which is complicated based on the differential density based on ocean currents, temperatures, salinities. The, so sound waves don't necessarily travel straight and that makes detection difficult, but, but ultimately like, like with radar and just like with visual observations in the atmosphere, you get an energy form of energy that'll bounce off the object and come back, you receive it, and you can determine basically how far away it is and at what direction. Same goes though, if you just want to, what they call passively listen. And, and that, therefore when a submarine, for example, or a UAP generate is moving through the water and somehow generating sound through fiction with the water or potentially a propulsion system like a propeller that also creates sound, you can passively listen for those sounds with a sonar and, and it's a little harder, but there are ways to determine the location, the angle, the bearing and range of it to you and, and then its speed of movement. So those are the two principal ways, passive and active acoustics. And, and but then, you know, ultimately, the, like in the atmosphere, some of the observations sort of defy our knowledge of how objects move in the water and even how sound uh, travels in the water. So that's one method, right? What, what's the other method of detect tracking objects? Uh, well, uh, there, there, you can use light, but the so just like an optical device, and their optical optical means of detection exist. You can see that picture of me scuba diving, and so obviously you can detect things at a certain range. It's more difficult because the water is does isn't a really effective medium for the transmission of light, and I, I mean there there are also magnetic type of detection capabilities that can get classified quick, but th that's another means. And, uh, and actually the, a lot of people in my world of the environmental science world will use magnetometers to study the nature, the geological nature of the seafloor. Oh, okay. Yeah. I remember, didn't the Russians make some submarine that wasn't magnetic? Some. I don't know about that. that. I, I'm unaware yeah. of that. 
yeah, there's crazy technology. I, I don't know, you know, under the sea, I don't think many people know much about, I've heard of one UAP underwater. That was from science Bob McGuire saying that he was on a ship that a UAP apparently went by very quickly. The radar operator noticed. Do you know of any, I guess, undersea UAPs? I do, several. In fact, gosh, they're just coming out all over. Of course, David Fravor observed something on the water under the Tic Tac, and that might be some, that was some kind of observation. I've had a submariner come to me, a Cold War era submariner, and describe for me something on sonar that really can't exist. It's the speed and movement of it. I've seen information just recently about objects going transmedium. This is data collected from Jerry and John Tedesco who are on the Galileo project. They developed their own collection system using X-band radar, EOIR, and uh, some other means, acoustic. And they've, they've seen objects, sphere, spheroids, basically, uh, only detectable in the IR, not visible. So you wouldn't see them if you were looking with your eyes, but there, he has all sorts of good data that shows them going, in, one going in and out of the water and others moving all around. Uh, and I could list a few more, but yeah, so there, these are coming up quite a bit now and I'm, I'm working to collect some more data and maybe get a potential, some more patterns of activity and, and again, get, get some research studies sanctioned at the national level by the groups I discussed in the, the Merge podcast with Ryan. Okay, excellent. Is there any way we can go to look at that, to look at that data? Jerry and John have not published it and everything else have been confidential reports right now. So you're not going to find much online. I think that one that's from the USS Omaha in Southern California of the, an object going into the water, that that's out there. So it's pretty limited on what you could find right now in terms of undersea UAP and transmedium activity. But yeah, I, that's, that's one of my other goals is to uncover some of that. I, I just want to cl close with something. Here I am, an ocean scientist for three and a half decades, and... I sit in a lot of meetings with leading ocean scientists still today, and we're tackling all the things that need to be tackled, whether it be ocean pollution or uh, climate change warming that's hurting fish and other other issues, negative and positive. But uh, it just it kind of mystifies me that more people are not intellectually curious about what the story of the century is. And that's these these that are occurring in the water. So if anything, I'd like to get our, our ocean science community and science community in general just more involved with, with the study of these phenomena so we can better understand them and, and know really how, how to interact with them and how to move forward. And yeah, Thanks. You mentioned in the Merge podcast as well that stigma does seem to be dropping because you said that you asked for funding for one of these one of these cases, right? Or to at least look into UAPs in some instance, scientifically, and they didn't laugh. They actually took it seriously. That's right. The, the Naval yeah. Studies Board of the National Academies of Science, Engineering, and Medicine, They, I briefed their chair, Admiral Retired Gary Ruffhead, and he agreed this is a, wor a study worthy of pursuing, And I, but, but I haven't gotten the funding yet. That's the issue, is I have to get funding from the government, being the agencies who would support it, Not NOAA, my old agency, the Naval Oceanographic Office, and uh, probably the Office of Naval Intelligence. So I'm in the process of building a case to see if they'll support a, a study to start to do a survey and look at look into some of the data sets for these. Okay. And you're one yeah. of the few officer, you know, general admiral officer out there speaking out. Have you had any negative reactions? Has anything negative happened in your life from speaking out on this and, and looking into this interesting topic? No, not at all. And in fact, I'm, I'm kind of energized because, for example, uh, as a professional oceanographer, the NASA study team had someone named Dr. Paula Bontempi, the dean of the Graduate School of Oceanography at University of Rhode Island, former NASA uh, Earth Systems Division lead, or I think, or I'm not sure of exact title. So like me, professional oceanographer with a, a heavy reputation online as the dean of a graduate school, and, and she's speaking about this. She's been on a podcast or two and I've had discussions with her. So she's trying to keep her mind open as well. And, and I feel you're right. This is a, this is, might be the time. And I, I'm, I'm uh, excited to be a champion for this. Excellent. Well, yeah. Thanks again. Thanks so much, sir. Right. Well, thank you, Chris. Finally, UAP Society, the organization I started has a UAP video challenge. You can go to our discord to get more information. The basic idea is to present in a video form 
What is your idea to get tangible UAP evidence? Is it a camera system? Is it an idea for an app? Can you build some sort of intercommunication device using Tesla coils? What is your idea? If you have an idea for UAPs to try and track down, get more evidence for the phenomenon, then this is your chance. You, all you have to do is put your idea into a video. It could just be you talking okay, with the PowerPoint presentation. The actual quality of the video doesn't matter. It is the idea. Can we execute the plan? Can we go fund it? Can we use it? And we will. If you post that video, put UAP DSI as a hashtag in the title and then have that up by the end of November, you will have a chance to win $1,000. Pick one winner of $1,000 and one second winner of $500. And the point is to get a bunch of videos and ideas out there about how we can get more evidence for the phenomenon. I hope you guys can get excited about this. I certainly am. And why not? Get your idea out there. Put your mouth where your money is and maybe get some money back and win $1,000 or $500 second place. So thank you so much for watching this. Let me know in the comments what you guys think. Please hit the like button. It really does help the video. And then subscribe. You can get future notifications of when I release my videos. And then please consider supporting the channel and you get additional benefit, ex exclusive videos on patreon.com forward slash Chris Lato. If just one in a hundred of you supported that would be more than enough to support my channel going into the future. So thank you so much for considering. Have a great day. Peace.